I'm Jean Cosman from Management Peace, and we are a task force of West Shore Unitarian Universalist Church. Um, they had no idea that when we formed a peace group, we would be doing something like this. Um, but that's what you know we decided we need to look at this issue, uh, both sides of it really. So there are some presentations that will uh, look at the positive uses of drones, mostly domestically. And uh, so we try to keep an open mind. Um, with it. Um, I have some just general announcements to make. One is that we are a smoke-free campus, so if you need to um, take a break in that action, you have to go out to the sidewalk or the smoke detector police will come after you. Um, if you need assistance, uh, look for the group that's wearing this t-shirt and flag us down and we can answer questions to the best of our ability, or else give you someone who can answer those questions. We have the drone quilt project here. Um, there are four quilts uh, throughout the, the church. These are, uh, each quilt, each square represents uh, the victim of a domestic, uh, victim of a drone strike overseas. Um, and the project is growing uh, to just bring awareness to what our government is doing in these other countries with drones. Um, let's see here. If you have to pick up a program when we're done here, you can grab one at the desk. We hope you sign in and give us your email because we're going to do a follow-up session in May to talk about where we go next. And we'd like to be able to send you that information. That's probably the only information you'll receive from us. So we're not going to sell your email address to, uh, to anybody or share it. Uh, let's see here. I just want to take a moment uh, to recognize that yesterday was the 46th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination and just uh, have a moment of silence um, considering all that he uh, did for peace and justice issues. Okay. Um, we are um, trying to keep this free and open. We really wanted people to be able to attend and not consider uh, the cost of doing something like this. But that being said, we have a donation basket um, at the sign up table, and, and we certainly will willingly accept any and all donations that uh, are going to put, putting this on. Um, and that being said, I think, I think my duties here are done. And uh, Nikki Antonio, um, who's a long time peace and justice advocate, and also my partner, she made me say that, um, will, <laughs> she, she's going to be a moderator and she will take over from here. So thanks for coming. Please stay for the whole event. It's, it's going to be good. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Thanks for being here this morning. Um, before we get started with the panel, um, I know this is in your program, but I want to just direct your attention to the mission of the Imagine Peace Task Force that put on this program this morning. The Imagine Peace Group provides a place to discuss and act on concerns about peace or the lack of peace in the world, to share our feelings and reactions to world events, and allows individuals to work towards achieving internal and external peace. And certainly that's why we're all here this morning. It's my honor to introduce um, the folks that are here on the panel. The way we're going to do the program this morning is that um, thanks to our professional timekeeper that we have with us today. <laughs> Time's up. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, there we go. <laughs> All right, so <coughs> Carol Adam is um, introduced, Susan Adam, I'm sorry, is uh, our official timekeeper. Uh, there are cards at the sides of the pews and pens or pencils, the pens for you. Um, so if you have questions uh, either right now or as our uh, panelists are speaking, we encourage you to write down, jot down a short question. Um, and our folks 
with the Imagine Peace t-shirts on. Um, we'll collect them, and then um, when all three speakers have, all three panelists have spoken, then we will uh, start a question and answer period. Um, so, and we're going to be introducing each speaker as they present. So our first speaker this morning is Nana Awad. She's an Ohio um, attorney. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in English Journalism and Public Relations from Miami University in Ohio, a JD from the Ohio, the Ohio State University's Burns College of Law, and um, also has a degree in International Legal Studies from New York University. She has a strong interest in human and civil rights, and as an attorney, she's worked on efforts to promote rights both domestically and internationally. Recently, Nyla conducted fact-finding in Haiti, helped author two human rights reports examining the increase in acts of gender-based violence and sexual exploitation in post-earthquake Haiti. She's also worked on war on terror issues from a human rights NGO reprieve, with uh, focus on um, human rights abuses at the military detention facility at Guantanamo, and she has worked to end the illegitimate use of drones in Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen through litigation, international advocacy, and corporal, corporate social responsibility. Nada Alam. that what my focus is going to be here is the use of drones internationally. Um, I guess just to start as like a little bit of an introduction, the U.S. has been using drones for a while, but it didn't begin using its first armed drones until October 2001. Um, the first alleged targeted drone ki killing occurred in Afghanistan in February 2002. We then expanded our drone program to Yemen in November of that year. We began operating drones in Pakistan in 2004 and in Somalia in 2007. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism estimates that during the Bush administration, about 52 um, drone attacks were carried out. Sure. And then, since the Obama administration has taken has taken over. Um, as many as 522 strikes have occurred. So there's been a significant increase during the Obama administration. Um, there are two different types of drone strikes, and I might be saying something that everyone here is already familiar with, but personality strikes and signature strikes. Personality strikes are when they're targeting specific individuals. Signature strikes are kind of based on this idea that they're going to fire based on suspicious patterns of behavior and like kind of um, what they believe are the signatures of terrorists, right? So what, what are these signatures? How do they determine it? It's not really known. There's been no set standards for that. And it's been reported that those are the bulk of the attacks that are carried out are these signature strikes. Those are the strikes that you hear about that end up hitting like wedding parties or groups of people who are meeting together because of the fact that when we see groups of people clumping together, a lot of times it's just kind of decided that it must be for nefarious purposes and therefore we're going to strike. Um, so with that in mind, when we're talking about the legality and the morality of the US's drone strike program, the focus tends to be a lot on the injuries and the deaths, right? Like that's where the focus lies, that's where the debate has been. But that's not the extent of the issues that are, arise with drones. Yes, the killings and the injuries, they have to be part of the discussion. Yes, they arise, raise serious questions under international human rights law, the laws of war, state laws, and state constitutions as well. But the thing that is often overlooked and that has to be part of the discussion is the way that the, these drones impact the communities over which they operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I'm talking about here is issues like the right to physical and mental health, the right to education, the right to assemble and maintain a cultural life, the right to work, 
all of these things are being impacted by the U.S.'s drone policy, and it's just not a part of the discussion that you hear when you're listening to the debates on TV generally. Um, so, with respect to physical and mental health, international law generally recognizes that everyone has a right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, and it considers that as deriving from the inherent dignity that of every human person. However, the way that drones are operating, and especially when we consider like the way that these signature strike policies are, that's really led to a lot of serious mental health problems in the affected communities. Basically, because of the way that the signature strikes are carried out, because people don't know when or where a strike may occur, because they're basically reminded that these drones are here because they're buzzing overhead constantly, and there's a constant reminder that at any moment, they could be hit by a Hellfire missile and their homes can be destroyed. It's led to a number of serious mental health problems in these communities. One is what's considered called anticipatory anxiety, which because people don't know when and where strikes are, will occur, they can't attempt to shield themselves or attempt to prevent themselves from getting injured. And in a report that was released by Stanford and NYU two years ago, they talked to a number of people in northern Waziristan, which is the area in Pakistan that's largely impacted by, has been most largely impacted by the drone strikes. And someone said that in that report, when describing kind of this anticipatory anxiety, everyone is scared all the time. When we're sitting together having a meeting, we're scared that there might be a strike. When you hear a drone circling the sky, you think it might strike you. We're always scared. So in addition to that, in addition to this anticipatory anxiety, there's also an issue with post-traumatic stress disorder in these areas, right? So individuals who are living in these areas report that they've suffered from emotional breakdowns, running indoors and hiding when drones appear, feigning nightmares, um, hyperspherical reactions to loud noises, outbursts to anger or irritability, loss of appetite, and other physical symptoms like hysteria, aches, pains, vomiting, respiratory distress, insomnia, and sleep disturbances. So, and it's also been shown to disproportionately affect more vulnerable populations, so children are more susceptible to these problems, right? And then, Okay, so kind of when we're talking about the ability of people who've been impacted with mental health problems or the people who have been injured by drones to access medical care, that's also a major problem in these areas because a lot of times they're remote. Healthcare isn't easily accessible, so they have to travel long distances. Oftentimes they can't um, get to those places in time or the loans that they have to take out to receive the medical care they need is something that's worth multiple, multiple years of earnings for these families. And they end up having to take out loans, which a lot of times becomes a problem because if their main breadwinner was harmed or killed in a strike, they don't really have a way to repay those. Also, the individuals who've been suffering mainly from mental health illnesses, the most severe people have been basically tied up into houses because they don't have any way else to deal with it. Um, the same report I mentioned earlier said that a person said that a number of individuals have lo lost their mental balance and are just locked in a room. Um, so basically, just like they're locked, people are locked in a prison, these people are locked in rooms because they can't handle day-to-day -day lives, and that's the way that people have decided to kind of address that situation since mental health professionals aren't available. Um, just quickly going on to education and um, the ability to assemble. Education has been considered one of the major kind of casualties to the U.S.'s drone campaign. Basically, once again, because of our signature strike policy, parents are afraid to send their kids to school because if people are gathering at school, there's a chance that that place is more likely to get targeted. So children are being denied the right to education. That's a right that's not only recognized in international law, but increasingly recognized in state constitutions, including the Constitution of Pakistan. Um, so that is, and it's a right that under international law is supposed to continue even in times of armed conflict. 
and it requires that um, education be provided in a physical, psychologically, and emotionally safe environment. With regards to the right to assemble, and just kind of exercise one's cultural life, both of which are rights guaranteed assembly, as we all know, in state constitutions, and at the international level, and the right to maintain a cultural life at the international level. Um, those are impacted in a number of ways, like I talked before about children being able to attend school. They can't really assemble at school, but also, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, weddings have been targeted, right? People have been hit at weddings. Um, dispute settlement bodies that have kind of met for decades, or not decades, but like generations upon generations, and these communities can't meet anymore because they've been hit. Um, funerals have been targeted, and actually there was one young boy whose family reprieve was, um, was representing who this boy had been meeting with his family during the month of Ramadan when Muslims fast and they gathered together in the evenings to break fast. His family was gathered together, went outside to do prayer, were going back inside to break their fast. The house was hit by hellfire missiles. He woke up, his family had been killed. Both of his legs had been amputated. He has since died from complications resulting from those injuries. But it just shows that like kind of the way and the manner in which we conduct the drone program isn't just causing the deaths and injuries that you hear about every day, but it's causing like a day-to-day -day impact on these societies and it's affecting a much broader population of the community than what people often imagine. And that has to be part of the debate when we're talking about the legitimacy of the US's program, drone program abroad. Um, and my time's up, so that works out well. <laughs>
uh, though it has gone down in Pakistan, it can go up at any time. I'd like to read something <clears throat> to start from uh, Chris Woods. This is a military campaign run by a secret service which raised problems of accountability, transparency, and a situation where neither the Pakistanis nor the Americans are clear about any agreements in place and where the reporting is difficult. All of this means that when things go wrong, there is simply no redress for the families who have been mistakenly killed. Now, this war on terror, as you know, began after 9-11. And by definition, a war on terror never ends, does it? Because we don't, we don't have any concept of this group of people called terrorists quitting what they're doing. And of course, the drones perpetuate it because they're creating so much anger among the people in these countries that uh, Nayla just lined up, Yemen, Somalia, which, and uh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Now, because the United States has not declared war against those three countries, the CIA controls the drone program. The CIA, which is run by Mr. John Brennan. Now, let's talk about how they decide. Well, they have what's called a kill list. And Mr. Brennan and Mr. Obama, President Obama, at least for a while, were meeting every Tuesday morning. Every Tuesday morning, and this has been highly reported, to decide who goes on the kill list. And, of course, the famous incident is Al Waki that you'll hear about from Jeremy Scahill. He, he does a beautiful job of explaining that. Well, Al Waki was an American citizen, as was his son. They were both killed by drone strikes. Now, uh, what about this kill list? Well, as, as she has said, you know, it's very unclear what the criteria is for killing someone. And let me just jump ahead and remind you that with these drones in, in the United States, US surveillance drones for so-called security, there will not be clear criteria then either. And which neighborhoods will probably have the drones flying over? Now, my friend Yoshiko says, well, they're flying over my apartment. I said, yes, and they're probably flying over some very poor neighborhoods as well because they're a very convenient tool for the police. Now, let's go on to how the broader picture. Well, the drones are made by the usual uh, defense contractors, and you know the names of them. Most of the major contractor is General Atomics, which is in San Diego, California. But then there's Northrop Grumman, and Boeing, and uh, Lockheed Martin, and on and on. So they're continuing to make money, especially as they expand this, this research and build new drones. The universities, many, many universities have research projects. And in Philadelphia, we have the University of Pennsylvania, which has a huge research project called the Grass Lab. Uh, if you check out the universities in Ohio, you will find, if you Google uh, whatever the name of it is, and drones, which ones are working on this research. Well, why do they do the research? Not just for fun. They get an enormous amount of Defense Department money. So again, we have this, this whole web of connections on a program that's very, very dangerous. Now we have the bases. At this point, there are 64 military bases in the United States that are drone bases. And it's gone from 30 to 64, and it's probably increasing. Well, 
and we have a place called Portion in Pennsylvania. That was an old naval air station, and now they're going to become a drone control center. So it's a way to re reactivate these bases that have been closed for years and years. Another point. And um, uh, now we have in the news that the United States is concerned about leaving Afghanistan because they have bases there that need to be protected by the U.S. military. See how it just becomes a continuum. It's a continuum because we are a militaristic country. And uh, so these are, again, I say, uh, enablers of this program. Now, I just want to read you before I have to stop um, and also recommend especially this report that comes out from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. And I have a, a list of resources that I've posted out there. But that's very important because they report on the drone casualties in uh, the other countries where they're being used. So here's the outgoing Pentagon General Counsel, Jeb Johnson, speaking of the war on terror. We must ask ourselves, how will this conflict end? War must be regarded as a finite, extraordinary, and unnatural state of affairs. We must not accept the current conflict as the, quote, new normal. Peace must be regarded as the norm toward which the human race continually strives. That was quoted by Glenn Greenwald, but it's outgoing Pentagon general. And that's quite a strong statement. And Noam Chomsky has said, war is the most extreme, a drone war is the most extreme terrorist war in history. So when we talk about terrorism, it has all these many, many connotations. And we, by using the drones, as Nyla has explained, are creating terrorist conditions for ordinary civilians in the countries where they're being used. Now, um, I think it's also important to realize that this business of pro proliferation, it's, it's a little bit different than nuclear proliferation. Uh, the drone proliferation has, there have been no standards set for that. And at this point, 74 countries, I think I'm right on that, have drones. But they're made by the United States, Britain, and Israel. Those are the three countries that are manufacturing them that we know of. And there might be others that I don't know of. But that's a lot of countries to have drones. So we have that proliferation question. And um, I think we also need to be very concerned about you know, getting caught up in how cute they are. Because if you go to visit some of these researchers, they'll bring out this little thing that they you know, they control remotely, and uh, they think it's cute. And I say, but you know, this has many, many other ramifications. And it's not just cute. And uh, so I think that's one issue. Children are caught up in thinking they're cute. And at the meantime, they're being developed to be more and more powerful. And by the way, there will be drones that are called autonomous drones which means they don't even need somebody at a control station. So thank you very much for considering these issues, and we'll develop them more in the uh, workshop. Thank you. Our next presenter is Mike Ferner. He grew up in rural Ohio, working on farms for much of his youth. After 12 years of Catholic education and a head full of John Wayne movies, he enlisted in the Navy right out of high school in 1969. During three years as a hospital corpsman, he nursed hundreds of wounded soldiers returning from Vietnam, an experience that radicalized him for life, starting with his discharge as a conscientious objector. Mike has been an independent member of the Toledo City Council and a candidate for mayor of his city, an organizer for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFSCME, the communications director for the Farmland Organizing Committee, 
and the program on corporations, law, and democracy, and has served as a national president of Veterans for Peace. Just prior to the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, he lived there for a month with the Voices in the Wilderness delegation, returning in 2004 for another two months as an independent journalist and wrote Inside the Red Zone, a veteran for peace reports from Iraq. His activism includes several arrests for disturbing the war, <laughs> including disrupting a session of Congress. His current interest in how the populace organized the largest democratic mass movement in the U.S. history and how to apply that to work he's doing with Move to America. Mike Furman. Thank you very much. Uh, that introduction sounds like it's for somebody who can't hold a job. <laughs> uh, it's probably true. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. It's uh, really great to be here with you. Uh, many of you may be aware of the widespread GI resistance movement during the war in Vietnam. And what one of the uh, ways that that movement was kept alive was through underground newspapers and publications of various sorts. And there were dozens, maybe hundreds of them that were, were printed. Some came out for one issue, some came out for years, distributed at army posts and navy bases. And I have one with me here today that is from the USS Kitty Hawk. It's an aircraft carrier. And uh, I was on a, a different carrier, uh, the Hancock. We didn't, we didn't have our own paper, but uh, I got this one from the Kitty Hawk. Uh, they named it Kitty Litter. Uh, <laughs> uh, the voices of the cockiest hawks, Kitty Litter. Uh, and it, the uh, first page story on it uh, was uh, written by a sailor. And very interestingly, uh, what he had to say uh, some 43 years ago uh, could be said almost word for word today. And uh, I'd, I'd like to read you uh, an excerpt from the November 1971 issue of Kitty Litter that uh, this GI resistor wrote. Here's, here's an excerpt from his article. Quote, it's clear that no American government will ever again be able to put a large conscripted army in the field. For years, American troops have been in silent mutiny in Vietnam. They are refusing to fight. They have become aware that the government lied to them, fooled them, tricked them, conscripted them to fight a war they intensely opposed. As the soldiers saw what was happening in Vietnam, they realized the Vietnamese were not their enemies. They began to select enemies within their own ranks. In 1970, 209 officers were killed by their own men. The message became clear to the makers of war. They could not commit massive ground troops to an unpopular war, so if you are a maker of war, what do you do? You get other people to fight. You give them weapons and train them and withdraw U.S. forces, as long as no mother's sons are coming home in plastic bags, there'll be no domestic opposition to continuing that war. The sailor that wrote this uh, read a trade publication put out by the Teledyne Corporation. And in that article, he learned about remotely piloted vehicles, or RPVs. And he wrote in his article that RPVs would be, quote, piloted by technicians and launched from the safety and comfort of an aircraft carrier. They can carry a variety of weapons and be guided automatically to a target. Only the so-called enemy gets killed. There are no POWs. And if a civilian is its victim, there will be no conscience-stricken warrior to expose the murder to the American people. It's a way to fight wars without having to draft Americans, or for that matter, even telling Americans what's going on. The advantage of this weapon system to the makers of war is that a handful of specially trained, highly paid technocrats can rain death on millions of people. As a Teledyne Corporation official put it, quote, in summary, the future of remotely piloted vehicles is as bright as it ever has been. 
Their lower cost, political acceptability, low risk to life make them very attractive candidates in a world of shrinking budgets and unpopular military operations. So ends the article in the Kitty Litter from 1971. Two generations, two generations later, I think there are some questions that demand our reflection and answers. First of all, how far has our movement come in 43 years if we're once again focusing on the particular evils of drones? And what does this tell us about our strategy or lack thereof? To be sure, drones are the empire in malevolent overdrive. We revile them for all the right reasons, and resisting them in earnest is important. But what does it say about our ability to create social change if today we are opposing a weapon system 43 years after it caught the attention of the GI resistance movement. If in the decades since 1971, we had been more conscious and strategic about our organizing, might we be further down the, down the road to a just and sustainable society by now? Put another way, what has been the opportunity cost of our type of activism? What have we not accomplished because of our focus on protesting weapon systems and invasions. <coughs> to try and answer that question, I'll assume that our movement's highest goal is to change the values of society from the bottom up to eliminate war and militarism from our culture. This assumption is significant because it means we understand that change comes from the power of the grassroots. But frankly, for all our work, I think our results leave something to be desired. We still devote the vast majority of our thinking, time, energy, and money to what could be called serial activism, reacting against a succession of various evils without a conscious strategy to actually change the values of society from the bottom up. We will always be reacting to empire's most vile manifestations. Certainly there is a wonderful educational impact in opposing drones or depleted uranium or sending special forces into yet another country. Over time, our serial activism may help change society's values. If it does, though, I think we should consider ourselves more lucky than smarter. It's simply not the best we can do. Activism is what we typically do year after year. One war, one environmental outrage, one attack after another on human rights. We work hard typically within very familiar circles to put together a rally or a conference. For outreach, we send some emails to groups outside this circle, inviting them to our event. Sometimes we go to other groups' picket lines. One of Chris Hedge's early books was called War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning. Surely the kind of righteous anti-war activism I'm describing gives us meaning. But to do more than just feel purposeful, to actually abolish war and militarism, I believe we need a conscious, coherent strategy, one that causes us to work with the powerful forces in society that our mostly white, middle-class peace movement talks about working with, but rarely does. Specifically, I'm talking about going beyond our typical circles and typical comfort zones to build solid relationships across lines of race and class based on struggles around issues of common importance. One good example of a common issue could be the national and the local negative impacts of military spending. An even better example, in my view, would be the movement to amend the Constitution to declare corporations are not people and money is not speech. This movement gets to the heart of what the Occupy movement so dramatically revealed that millions of people can see beyond our myriad problems to the more fundamental goal of a better life, a life we deserve, but simply won't be able to achieve without greater democracy and freedom from corporate control. Many of us here today are familiar with the kind of organizing that's required to win this better life. We know what kind of organizing it will take, but my concern is that our precious time and energy are still mostly spent on serial activism. Please, please note and be sure to understand that I'm not saying we should quit trying to stop invasions or drone strikes or weapon systems or stop our efforts to gain universal health care or better neighborhoods and schools. 
I am saying that we simply must do more than that. On the road to fundamental social change, it's very important to fight fires, but we can and must do more. We need to consciously practice fire prevention, not just give it lip service while we respond to the next alarm. Reacting to the evils of empire is necessary, but if it's the only thing we do, it will forever be the only thing we do. I believe it's our responsibility to the movement to assess how effective we've been over the last two generations, so that two generations from now, people will not simply be opposing the last empire of a dying planet, but will actually be living the kind of life the Earth and all its inhabitants deserve.
Um, but it also like deters people from going and rescuing people, which means that like when people are injured and civilians are harmed, the likelihood that they're going to be able to obtain medical treatment in the time necessary to effectively treat those wounds or perhaps save their lives is like significantly diminished and also increases the rates of death too. Um, we have a question on how involved the Muslim community is in anti-war, anti-drone efforts. Honestly, the Muslim community, how involved? How involved is the Muslim community? I'm imagining that this question is um, talking about in this country, how involved is the Muslim community in anti-war, anti-drone efforts? You know, I actually can't speak to that specifically. Um, most of the work I've done related to drones was in the UK. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I have to say that I've often been surprised at how few Muslims I've seen at national protests and stuff, um, anti-war protests. I don't know if that's because people are concerned that they might be targeted or something, but um, it's definitely, you don't see huge portions of the Muslim community, but I don't know that there might be people organizing and there might be demonstrations and I'm just not particularly aware of or haven't been affiliated with those particular efforts. I have seen in particular large groups of Pakistani people at demonstrations. They're the, they're the most prominent in my, in my experience. And just to follow up, um, if there would be a fear in this country, what would that fear be? I mean, so I can actually say even like just like in Columbus, when the Muslim community, for instance, live like the, there's a mosque and there's a lot of houses around that and the FBI just kind of targets that community and comes and asks some questions for like videos that they've even watched online. So I could see people potentially being kind of concerned about the ramifications of engaging in protests and stuff like that at times. And you know, a lot of the typical sorts of uh, harassment and dangers that any number of groups have experienced in this country. You know, employment, you know, your, your boss finds out that uh, uh, because you went to a demonstration, uh, you're a Muslim and uh, you don't have a union and uh, just wants to prove what a patriot he is, you, know, you might be out of a job. Um, you know, people's uh, businesses you know, that have been destroyed, I mean, the list just goes on and on. And it, it, it mirrors the kind of oppression that other other groups in society have experienced. And, uh, I think the uh, the Muslims that stand up and are are counted are incredibly courageous. Thank you. There's a couple of uh, questions here around. Um, the issue that was talked about in terms of if we have one, what could universities and defense contractors be doing for peace technology for profit and jobs? Um, and so I guess I'll, I'll put that one out. And then the other question that's sort of attached to goes along with this is what corporations benefit from producing and servicing drones? So, so this idea that um, there's certainly an economic, a job stream to all of this. So part one question is, is there an alternative that both the universities and these corporations could be doing uh, to provide jobs and technology? And then who are the ones that are benefiting from that? Well, I can just say that obviously there's all kinds of technology that would be beneficial to human beings and our life on the planet. I mean, for one thing, the environmental technology is extremely important. Um, and I'm sure universities are working on it, but to me, it hasn't been prominent in what I've looked at. Uh, the prominent uh, work at Penn, for instance, is I think they get $21 million, no, wait a minute, 21% of their money for research comes from the Department of Defense. Well, the Department of Defense is mainly working on weapons. They're not working on the environment. And so they choose to take their money 
uh, to use it for the designated purposes. Now, I'm sure they're doing a lot of other good research, but I haven't spent a lot of time looking into that. And the, the defense contractors, again, they're always looking for new projects. And they uh, take what the government gives them to do. So they, as I, I pointed out, the, co the corporations that are well known to all of you, I'm sure, at Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, General Atomics makes these drones, um, and uh, Lockheed Martin, and on it goes. So the, the defense contractors are still doing what they've always done. Employment, I can't say how much it's increased in that area. I, I don't know that. I, um, I guess like kind of one thing I would add. So General Atomic is not a publicly held corporation, so it's harder to kind of hold it accountable in some respects. Um, there are a number of companies, as like she mentioned, that are um, involved in the manufacture and production of drones. Um, interestingly, Parker Canopy Corporation, which is based in Cleveland, General Atomics on one of their press releases, and I believe it was 2012, um, released a statement saying that they were making the landing gear for drones um, that are used on the Predator Reef for drones in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. Uh, it is kind of difficult to determine what the best way would be to disincentivize companies from doing that. Um, a lot of them are making a lot of money from this, but one thing that I know that Capriv had some success with was going through to pension funds, like Danish pension funds, that were investing in these companies and getting them to basically divest. Um, there was a lot of press when um, individuals in that country found out that companies that were providing them, like their pension funds were invested in, were um, invested in the drones. Um, so I think that if you can make it so that it is going to be hit their pocketbooks by making it so that they don't have the economic incentive so much to engage in the manufacturing and production of drones, that that can be a useful way to go about it. Um, but it just depends how effective that would be, and I don't know how many people in the U.S. would raise their arms and be upset if they found out that some certain of their investments were going into the drones programs. I'd, I'd like to add that uh, this question is a, a perfect example of uh, getting to some of the fundamentals, such as what kind of life do we want to live? And uh, yes, we could uh, do boycotts of, of companies that are involved in weapons production, and yes, we could do divestment campaigns, and all these have been done, and some of them have a, a good effect. Uh, but personally, uh, I'm, I'm to the point where I want to work to create a world where we don't produce these kinds of uh, weaponry. Uh, that if people lose jobs as a result, we use the tremendous wealth that this country has to employ them in, in other industries. Uh, we know this can be done, as Marge mentioned. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of what we could be doing. Uh, the question is, is who's running the show? And we're not. And uh, until we do, we're gonna be fighting the same uh, rear guard actions that, that we've become too familiar with. And one follow-up to this question, which is just if any of you have uh, the knowledge whether Case Western Reserve is involved um, in, the, in, in this research. And so, and it's, if you don't know, how, how does what the folks leaving here today who maybe want to do some research and find out is my uh, university that I, is either my alma mater or, or someone, you know, important to my community, how, how does one find that out? How would one find that out? One, one way is to uh, look for DARPA, D-A-R-P-A, -A, Defense, blah, 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 Nightmare Association. Uh, where they come up with uh, all this really whacked out stuff, including drones, but <coughs> the list is very long. And uh, this is a, a that funnels most of the uh, military money to universities. So you can look at universities, particularly uh, public ones, and see uh, in their revenue stream what's coming from DARPA. And I haven't done this, but I would assume that uh, one of the bits of information still available to the public would be to uh, do some research on DARPA and see, uh, if not which universities, at least how much money 
uh, they allocate to university research. Yes, I'd like to add to that. Uh, there's a there's a group that's uh, there's a list that's moderated mostly by Nick Monturn, I believe, and he uh, does an incredible job of finding these universities and adding to the list. So there's a very very long list. Go to www.nodrones. K N O W. Is that right, Nadia? Yeah. K N O W Drones org. And that list is updated continually. I really recommend that you go to that website, www.nodrones.org. And that list is being updated. Now, one of the things I didn't mention is this uh, Bright Patterson Air Force Base. I think it's in Dayton. Yes. They have a, a, a lot of drone work going on there that you should focus on. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Again, this, you may or may not have information on this. Uh, well, someone wants to know, what is the current status, if known, of Afghan anti-drone activist Kareem Khan? He was arrested and abducted in February. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, and we may, we may have someone who uh, may know about that later, but thank you uh, for that. And uh, he was released. He was released. Okay. Okay, it was Pakistan and he was released. Okay, great. So, for whoever had that question, good news. Um, okay, so um, before we um, just go to some uh, final acknowledgements, um, we're at the, just about at the end of our time. I wanted to ask each panelist if you just have some very brief but closing remarks that you'd like to give. I will, I will say, I will frame this with many of the questions we couldn't get to are around this whole issue of how do we create that world we want, what can we do, so maybe if, if you have some thoughts on that as your, as your closing remarks, maybe. Uh, I mean, I think that kind of, if we're talking about like where do we go from here, like a lot of it has to deal with like getting it from various bases. I think it's been clear in the U.S. that we're not going to be able to really bring successful legal challenges in the courts here. The courts are going to dismiss those cases, um, which is why sometimes you have to look towards foreign courts. And obviously, the U.S. doesn't put much stock into international courts a lot of times. But I think a lot of the efforts need to be based on not only making the government actors involved, like held more accountable, and making more voices heard here, but also kind of addressing the people who are facilitating our drone campaigns abroad. Um, we definitely have our hands in other countries and provide us with intelligence needed to carry out strikes and such like that. Um, and it's, Before we started, um, I was talking with G, and she mentioned that uh, they had made some attempts to get some uh, black activists, uh, I believe ministers, in, uh, involved in participating in the, in the conference and uh, for one reason or another it didn't work out and uh, I can't tell you that we do all that great a job in, in Toledo if we did a conference like this the audience would probably look pretty pretty close to what this one looks like. Uh, but it, it, it just takes time and it's just something that, that it's important to work on. Uh, that's why in my remarks I was trying to stress the sorts of, of common issues that uh, would, would cause us uh, to work with people uh, that we don't often work with in the, in the standard uh, peace movement. And it, it takes, you know, it, it takes some work and it, and it takes a real commitment and going to meet with people, not just inviting them to uh, events, but going uh, to where they are and meeting with them and finding out what's important what they're working on, uh, what we might be able to join together. Well, I'd like to start by saying, uh, in this age of electronic technology, I hope we don't lose our humanity in terms of empathizing with all the people that are victims of US policies of militarism. It's, it's depressing, it's emotionally difficult, 
but gather together, be in groups, and don't lose your humanity. And, and as this one person said, the empathy for what's happening to individuals who have nothing to do with militants or Al-Qaeda or any of that. And secondly, uh, try to educate your, your public. Um, as I say, we've done this walk, and we wear the white mask and black, and, and it really does attract attention. It's a theater piece, and it attracts attention and forces people to think for a minute about this kind of warfare. So we're dressing up as civilians who are killed in warfare. That's the point. And we always give out information, always have a leaflet. That's what we do. And they're doing it in other communities. So if you can possibly get something going publicly. Because the public says two things. What is a drone? And it saves American lives. Those are usually the comments. Thank you. So we'd like to thank, thank all three of our panelists, Nyla, Awan, Mike Ferner, and Marge Van Cleef. Let's thank them again. Let's give them a round of applause. 